In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. As you know, we've been um, going through a series on the Ten Commandments with our sermons uh, of late, and it brings us today to the Sixth Commandment. And as we read in Exodus chapter 20, in the Sixth Commandment, it says, you shall not kill. Which, of course, brings us to today's practical point on the way of the warrior saint, don't murder. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. I'm just kidding. We're not getting off that easy. And it's true. We don't get off that easy. We hear that, and we think that that's the end all and be all. We think that that's everything. We think that that's it. But Christ goes further. In chapter 5 of Matthew, as he's delivering the Sermon on the Mount, and, and he unpacks what that means, you shall not kill, a little bit differently than we often think it means. He says, you have heard it that it sh was said to the men of old, you shall not kill, but whoever, and whoever kills shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you, anyone who is angry with his brother shall be liable to ju judgment. Whoever insults his brother shall be liable to judgment. And whoever says, you fool, shall be liable to judgment. Now, we might be like getting a little bit uncomfortable now. Because what does that mean? Surely, I don't kill anyone. I'm good. Are we angry with people? Do we insult each other? Look on Facebook. Do we ever think, oh, that boy's crazy. That person's nuts. Oh, they're just doing that because they're, they're insane. And what is that definition of insane? Usually it means they're insane because they don't believe what I believe. That's our definition of insanity in others, right? If you really want to see it play out, think about things. So I've worked at a church for almost 15 years since graduating from seminary, full-time in parish ministry. I might say the same thing, exact same thing to two people about something that might be seen as controversial. And that same exact thing, depending on what side they're on, becomes the usage for them to accuse me of being on the other side of them. What does that mean? It means that it's very difficult for us to get away from that. But then they go out and they spread those things, right? And people t say all kinds of things about us. If I told you the things that I have heard about myself that I know for a fact not to be true, you would probably be amazed. And you've probably even heard some of those things. Some of you maybe even have shared those things. It's uncomfortable when we think about that because we don't think of those things within the context of you shall not kill. But in reality, that is exactly the context in which they should be placed. So we have to ask ourselves, where do those things come from? What drives us to do these things to one another? What propels us? What motivates us to do these things? And I think there are three major motivators that push us to do these things, that block us from doing what we know to be right. The first is pride. They don't agree with me, and I'm obviously right. Therefore, they are wrong. The second, which stems from that pride, is jealousy. Why do they have that and I don't? Why do they get to do those things and I don't? It was funny. I think back to like my younger days. And working at, at a camp, you're on staff with these people, you're living in cabins with these people, you're on top of each other, and it becomes very easy to like always think that someone is getting to do something better than what you're getting to do. So there was this one guy who was mad at me because I got to chant, and I was mad at him because he got to serve in the altar. I was a better chanter, so I, they put me at the chanter stand. And he was better in the altar, so they put him in the altar. Why am I going to be jealous of that? Like, do I think I should be able to serve in the altar while chanting? Or does he think vice versa, that he should be chanting while serving in the altar? It's stupid. But these are the things that jealousy leads us to. These are the arguments that jealousy leads us to. And then finally, that jealousy ultimately leads us to fear, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Because we then are afraid to get out of that cycle of pride and jealousy that now we've created for ourselves. 
And this cycle of pride and jealousy often comes because we are not looking at what we're doing. We don't think that we are creating murder because I'm not killing anyone. But we don't see what our words actually do. But Christ makes it very clear that when we are looking at other people and what they are doing and what they have and not focusing on ourselves, we will be lost. He says, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye but fail to see the log that is in your own? We think we're going to help people when we're doing these things, when we're saying these things about them, because somehow we're going to save them. And in our pride, we forget to see that there's a log in our own eye. There's something blocking us, creating that same very cycle that we are accusing other people of being a part of that leads us to that. And Christ says very clearly, without removing that log from our eye, we will never, never see clearly. Which now brings us to the actual practical points on our way of the warrior saint. How do we break this cycle? How do we get out of this funk, this, this pride, jealousy, fear that we are constantly in, causing us to, to fight with one another, to, to hurt one another without even knowing that we're hurting one another? The first we hear beautifully displayed in today's gospel is we have to seek Christ. Four men were so adamant that they wanted their friend who was paralyzed to be healed. That they sought Christ out for that healing and they literally removed the roof from the house where Christ was so that they could lower their friend who was paralyzed in. We don't want to get out of bed to go to church on Sundays. Trust me, when my alarm went off this morning, I did not want to get out of bed to go to church today. These men sought Christ to the point where they removed the roof from the house that he was in. You can imagine the homeowner was not happy with that. How, what can we do to seek Christ in the same way? What actions are we willing to take so that we are removing the barriers that are between us and God? I'm sure there's many things that we could be doing. Think about it when it comes to Wednesday and Friday this week and there's extra church services. Think about it Wednesday night when we have Bible study. What are those barriers that are staying in between you and seeking Christ? And how can you remove them? The next thing we need to do is to get over this jealousy is we need to develop this attitude of gratitude that Father Chris has been talking about. The gospel ends with this beautiful phrase, they marveled at what they saw and were amazed and glorified God saying, we have never seen anything like this. When we're looking at what other people have, we are not able, hi Baba, we are not able to glorify God and be amazed at what we see because we're so focused on what others have and how we want what they have that we fail to see the blessings that God has given us. And when we fail to see the blessings that God has given us, we will never be satisfied. We will always want more. And we will never be able to see we have never seen anything like this. And when we aren't able to do those things, when we aren't able to seek Christ and to be grateful for what we have and marvel at the things that God has given us, we can never come to the final thing, which is ultimately what we're really afraid of, is making peace. Because making peace is difficult. Because making peace means that sometimes we have to say, I was wrong. And we're afraid to say that. In our pride, we're afraid to say, I screwed up. I'm sorry. We'd rather dig our heels in and stop talking to someone for 25 plus years than actually admit, maybe I could have done something a little bit differently. Maybe I could have done things a little differently, and I'm sorry for my part in it. But Christ tells us very clearly that we are called to make peace with one another. He says in that Sermon on the Mount that we've been looking at so much today, if you know that your brother has something against you, leave your gift before you make your gift at the altar. Go and make peace, and then come offer your gift. 
Don't dig your heels in. Nowhere in that passage does it say, dig your heels in, know that you are right, be completely affirmed in what delusion you have created for yourself. It says, leave your gift, go and make peace, and then come back and offer your gift before the altar. And it's tough. And I know it's tough. And Christ even recognizes that it's tough. We'd rather take the route that is easy, that cycle of pride, jealousy, and fear, that cycle that allows us to keep fighting with one another, that allows us to keep staying angry, that allows us to do what we want to do rather than what we know we should do. But Christ warns us about that at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. And he says in Matthew 7, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. By comparison, that narrow gate, that way that is difficult, leads to life. May our great God, who loves us, allow us to have the strength to follow that gate that leads to life. And also, don't murder. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen.